Thank you so much for tuning in to Hear Wings Radio. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's our show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Wings Radio Show. Got a little bit of a thunderstorm going on outside there. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and today we are going to be talking about being sifted and what that means. I am actually uh, taking a lot of this show from a sermon that was written by Reverend Brian Bill, and I would like to give him credit for that. I came across his sermon in doing some research, and I liked so many things in it that I only added a little bit of my own, so we'll see what y'all think. If you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22, you are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint to you a kingdom, as my Father has appointed to me, obviously this is Jesus speaking, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both into prison and to death. Now, what was Jesus talking about? Well, it goes on to tell us in verse 34. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that you shall thrice deny that you know me. Why was Jesus warning Simon Peter that Satan wanted to sift him? Because he saw that Peter was going to sin and that Peter was going to become discouraged that he had sinned. I can relate. What is sifting? Should we care if we're about to be sifted? Is there any way to tell if we are? I don't know if we can tell if we're about to be sifted, but I do think we should care because I don't think it is fun. I want to tell y'all an interesting thing. Word has it, Simon Peter's house was found some years ago in Capernaum by Italian excavators. I don't know if y'all like archaeology. I love biblical archaeology, and I get the magazine and usually read it cover to cover. It was reported in Biblical Archaeology Review over 25 years ago. An article on the internet on Bible History Daily reads, which is their site, reads, Buried beneath the remains of an octagonal Byzantine martyrium church, excavators found the ruins of a rather mundane dwelling dating to the first century B.C., the very house in which Jesus stayed, taught, and healed the mother-in-law. Simon Peter's house had been located, identified by etchings of crosses, and over 100 graffiti in five ancient languages scattered over upon the foundation stones and remaining wall structures. The house has been dated to the time of Jesus by coins found within. Fish hooks were found under the pavement. A large room had been forged in the middle of the house, which had been plastered several times over, a sign of frequent use, undoubtedly as a gathering place. The walls were too weak to support a tile roof. Tree branches, palm fronds, and mud were used instead. Reminiscent of Mark 2, 1 through 5, the story of letting the paralyzed man down through the roof. Peter's living room in Capernaum, right beside the seashore, is the earliest church ever found. Jesus himself was the pastor. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. Recently, y'all, I walked out my front door and I was going to take a little spin on my 10 speed bike. I don't do that real often, but I do it some because I, I still like bicycle riding. I rode bikes the whole time I was growing up. And as I was about to get on the bike, I thought, well, I better check the tires. I haven't ridden in a few months. And there was no air in the tires. Y'all ever have that happen? There's no air in your tires and you want to go riding somewhere? There was no air in my tires. It had just slowly leaked out, I guess. Peter had some slow leaks going on in his spiritual life, too. And many of us do as well. In the verses that we just read, one thing that we can see is that our failures are not final with God. Isn't that good news? Let's talk about two truths from those verses I just read. Number one, Satan is our adversary. Of that, there can be no doubt. Satan, y'all, is out to take you out. He wants to sift us. 
Simon, Simon, Satan has asked you, have you, and to sift you as wheat. The word sift is an agricultural term. When wheat was harvested, the kernel would be crushed, and then the wheat would be tossed into the air to blow the chaff away. They would put the grain into a square box covered with netting, turn it upside down, and start shaking it violently. The idea is that all the dirt and the junk would fall out and leave behind just the clean grain. Satan wants to turn us upside down and shake us to pieces. 1 Peter 5 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. And Revelation 12.10 tells us that he stands accusing us night and day. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Behind every spiritual failure is a spiritual enemy. It's very interesting, isn't it, that Jesus allowed the adversary to attack a follower. Why didn't he just tell Satan to buzz off? Why didn't he just tell him that for us? The reason is because he knew that Peter would ultimately profit from this. Though it would be extremely painful, Satan is on a short leash and couldn't go no further than God allows. A second truth that we can get from all these verses is Jesus is our advocate. I love that Jesus intercedes for us. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. While Satan goes after everyone, he seems to especially have a bullseye on anyone who is highly anointed, anyone who is bold in witnessing to others, that's many of you, and on leaders. Because, y'all, we're all a threat to him. If he can torpedo Peter's faith, who was a leader, just imagine how disheartened others will be and how discouraged if they fail. Jesus did not pray to keep Peter away from the sifting, but that his faith would ultimately not fail. The Schofield Bible has a note that reads, Peter was the wheat and his self-confidence was the chaff. There is a story of rebellion, repentance, and restoration in these verses. The rebellion was when uh, Jesus told Peter that he would turn away, and when he turned away, when he denied Christ, that was the rebellion. Then he repent, repented after Jesus looked at him with such great love. And then Jesus restored him, right? And he went on to do great things for the Lord. He wrote part of the New Testament. I have good news for y'all today. If you have failed in some way, even a big way, it's not over. It's not over till God says it's over. While Peter's denial of Christ was a huge spiritual blowout, there was actually some slow leaks going on for some time. Leaks like these can go unseen and unnoticed in our lives for quite a while before we see that something's wrong. Peter was a little bit proud. The disciples had just been arguing about who was the greatest. In John thirteen thirty seven, Peter had said that he would lay down his life for Christ. In Luke twenty two thirty three, he said that he was willing to go with Jesus to prison and even to death. How many of us go around saying the same thing? You know, we are in the end times, y'all. We are going to face times of persecution, martyrdom, and all that. Uh, it's going to happen in this generation. How many of us have said the same thing? Lord, I would die for you. I would die for your name. I would go to prison for you or whatever. How many of us have done this same thing? We need to, to think about this. And in Matthew twenty six thirty three, he said, even if everybody else falls away on account of you, I won't. I never will, he said. He thought that, you know, may, maybe he thought, we don't know for sure, maybe he thought he was a little bit stronger than the others, or, or maybe he was just a real passionate person. But he said, even if I have to die with you, you know, I won't disown you, Jesus. We need to be careful, y'all, about this kind of pride, because we don't know until we're in that moment, and we see what we're facing, what we'll truly do. We hope that we are willing to go all the way to the cross with Jesus and not just follow from a distance. But we don't know for sure. What does 1 Corinthians ten twelve say? Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Peter maybe didn't pray quite as much as he should. That'll sure let the air out of your tires, won't it? 
In Luke twenty two forty five, 45, we see that Peter fell asleep instead of doing battle in prayer. Now, that happens to a lot of us, y'all, if we try to do battle late at night. And sometimes you just have an exhausting day and it happens. But when Jesus was about to go to the cross, that was not a good time for it to happen, right? In verse 46, Jesus tells them that prayer can keep them from temptation. Without prayer, we have no power to fight. Without prayer, we actually don't have any power to fight any of our enemies. Peter had a little bit of a tendency to react out of his emotions instead of out of his spirit. A good indication of that is in John 18.10, where Peter took a sword and sliced off a servant's ear and then took off because he was scared. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, let me tell you something about this. This was not just any servant's ear. That was a high priest's servant. You were not allowed to go in and into the tabernacle and serve if you were not perfect. So if he had an ear missing, he didn't have a job anymore. You know, another bad thing about cutting off Malchus' ear was Jesus didn't tell Peter to do that. How often do we pray about something But then we don't wait on the answer. We just jump up and go out and do it. I think I did that when I married Jerry. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I thought I got answers. But I got wrong answers because of being an idolatry. But apparently I needed a bigger answer and didn't get one. I think that we have a habit of praying and saying, Okay, well, he's not telling me not to do this. So it must be okay to do this. We need to be really careful about that, y'all. Especially in the times we are walking in. Scripture continues the story and says, Peter followed him, Jesus, afar off to the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. I think a lot of us follow Jesus from afar off. Close enough to get the scoop on what's going on, but not close enough to him that we have to suffer any persecution or we have to sacrifice anything. As Satan sifted, Peter shifted, and then his failure was exposed. But it still wasn't over for him. As Peter was cursing and denying Jesus, he hears a cock crowing. He probably froze in mid-sentence, because the last part of verse 74 indicates that this happened right after or immediately after his third denial. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said to him, Before the cock crow, you shall deny me thrice. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Can I just say that it's a good thing when we feel bad like that? Our conscience is a gift from God. It's like spiritual GPS. That's what Nicole calls it. And she's so right. It's our spiritual guidance system. And the Lord can use our guilt to bring us back to that which is good. Peter was imperfect like all of us. But he did love Jesus. At the point of Peter's third denial, Jesus looked at him. And this is portrayed so powerfully in the uh, Passion of the Christ. He looked straight at Peter with his face covered in spit and bruised by all the blows that he had taken. And Peter sees the pain, but he also sees the pardon. The look of love from his Lord broke Peter's proud heart, and it should break ours. Romans 2 4 says, Or despise you the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. There is a hymn, and part of the words say, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim and more thunder in light of his glory and grace. The path to restoration requires true repentance. You cannot undo a sin you have committed, but you can truly repent. You cannot repeat the sin. You cannot stay in the sin. You can change direction. That is what true repentance is. For you that are new Christians, to repent means to turn around and change direction and to ask God to forgive you that, you know, you got off in the wrong direction there. There are times when we fail. And you feel like you cannot be forgiven. When I was a new Christian, that happened to me early in my walk. Because 
I had all kinds of sin going on. And I got saved. My spirit was saved. But my body was still wanting to go out in the world and do all the stuff. And I got into sin. And I started asking God for forgiveness. And I remember I was blaming the other person for the sin too. And so God just didn't hear my prayer at all, I guess, on that one. And I didn't get any answer from God. And I prayed like that for two weeks. And I really was repenting. And I gave up. I thought, that's it. That's it. I'm going to hell. That's it. You must only get one chance with God. And that's it. You don't get any more. So I went back out into the world. And it was a while before God sent me a message. And when he did, he did it the most unusual way. I was driving from um, New Iberia, Louisiana, to Morgan City, Louisiana. And you have to go through a little town called Patterson. And there was a church there that had um, a billboard up. And I have a picture of that billboard in one of my old photo albums. Y'all remember when we used photo albums to keep our photos? And it had three cro- the three crosses of Calvary on it. And it said, in big letters, it said, His offer still stands. And he spoke to me through that billboard and called me back to him. And I ran to him. I was so happy that God still wanted to talk to me. After Jesus was crucified, the disciples got scared. And they went into hiding. Which who can blame them because the Pharisees killed Jesus. It was perfectly understandable to think they were going to come after the disciples next because they were trying to stop the message. Three days later, on Resurrection Day, Jesus rises from the dead and begins appearing to a lot of people. And I love what the angel said to the women who had come to the empty tomb in Mark sixteen seven. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said to you. So you're going to see him in Galilee just like he told you you were. Go tell his disciples and Peter. The angel wanted to be sure Peter got the news that Jesus was alive again. In John 21, we read that Peter is still bummed out, so he decides to go fishing with his buddies. Maybe he's thinking that if he does something he's good at, he'll feel better. What he's actually doing is going back to his old life. Let me tell you something. Once you are saved, once you truly believe in the Lord, it is always going to be unsatisfying to go back to the way you once lived. You can sin again, but once you've truly belonged to Jesus, you won't enjoy it nearly as much. And the consequences for it will be far worse than they were before. So Peter's now in a free fall down the slippery slope of failure. And he can't even catch any fish. Early that morning on on shore... A man asked them how the fishing was going. They shout to him and tell him that they struck out. They didn't catch any fish. And this man told them to throw their nets on the other side of the boat and they would get some fish. When they followed through with his suggestion, they caught so many fish, they couldn't even pull in the net. It was at that point that the disciples recognized that the man was actually Jesus. Peter, true to his impulsive nature, jumped into the water and swam for shore, but who could blame him? After having breakfast on the beach, Jesus restores Peter to ministry. One pastor writes that there are a lot of things that Jesus could have said to Peter. He could have responded to him like some of us would have. He could have treated him with silence and given him the cold shoulder. He could have expressed anger and just let Peter suffer. Or he might have said, you know, Peter, I just don't trust you anymore. He could have brought up his failure in every conversation. Y'all recognize some of these tactics? I know you do. He could have talked to all the other disciples about it. Remember that night when Peter denied me? He could have excluded him and found subtle and not so subtle ways to punish him. You know, those are all human ways of dealing with someone wronging us, aren't they? We're hard on people who sin differently than we do, aren't we? But there's a lot we can learn about how Jesus restores Peter in John 21. He tells him to love, number one. After breakfast is over, Jesus publicly forgives and reinstates Peter. This is for Peter's benefit and also provides some teaching for the other six disciples who are listening to the conversation. As Peter smells the charcoal fire and feels its heat, he's reminded, I'm sure, of how he warmed himself next to a fire in a courtyard right before he denied Jesus three times. I think Peter must have been taken aback when Jesus greeted him with Simon, son of John. He probably wished Jesus would have called him Peter, a piece of the rock. But he knew that he was anything but a rock right then. And Jesus then asked him a question. Do you truly love me more than these? Who was Jesus talking about? Was he talking about the fish? 
Was he talking about the boat and the fishing supplies? No, Jesus wanted Peter to admit that his pride was gone. He could no longer say that he was better than the other disciples. Instead of bragging, Peter was broken. But that's a good place to be according to Psalm 51:17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Why is that? Because when you are broken, you are very humble. When your sin grieves you as it should and it breaks you and you weep before the Lord, he will take you back in a heartbeat. You'll ever see that there's a commercial on television. You probably don't see it in other parts of the country. Down here, there's a place called, uh, I think it's called DFW Shoe Store or something like that. And they have a, a special thing where you can buy shoes, I guess, for thirty nine ninety five, and there's free shipping. And they have this little commercial on television where this girl's in this closet that's the size of my living room. She has all these shoes in all these different colors, and her boyfriend walks in, and he was like, oh, no, she's buying more shoes. And he points to the shoes because she has more bags of shoes by her feet, and she's talking about DFW, whatever it is, and... She said, he tur- he turns to storm out of the room and she says, sorry. As soon as he gets out of the room, she looks at the camera and she goes, not sorry. That's how a lot of us are with our sin. We say, oh, sorry, Lord, and we think we're forgiven. And then we go on and do the sin again. Why do we do that? Because we're not sorry. We're not really sorry. If you truly repent, you change direction. If you did not change direction, there was no true repentance. And true repentance is required for forgiveness. In fact, it was Peter that said this in Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible has a lot to say about repentance, y'all. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes of them shall have mercy. Jesus could have asked Peter anything or done some teaching or told a parable, but he chose to ascertain his love level. Twice more he asked Peter if he loved him. In verse 17 We read that Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? Through the repetition of the same question, Jesus is bringing out the depth of Peter's penitence. What about us? What do you value most in life? Do you value your kids, your job, possessions, people, your own pride? Is there anything or anyone that you love more than the Lord? I ask you because if there is, Satan already knows what it is and he knows how to use it against you. And if you know there is something you love more than the Lord, something you will compromise for, I urge you to take care of that before Satan has a chance to use it against you because it is not pretty when he does that, y'all. Okay, the second thing in how Jesus restored Peter was serve. With each of Peter's replies, Jesus gives him a task to do. The Lord is not looking at Peter's past. He is focused on what Peter can do in the future. There's a man listening to this show right now, and you have failed. Not in one thing. You have failed in several things, the Lord says. And he said that you are just broken inside because you're so discouraged about these weaknesses. And the Lord says to tell you, sir... Those are just preparation. God was showing you where your weaknesses were. He said he was pointing to them so you would see them because he knows you have the strength in you through him to overcome these sins and that he plans to use you in the future and that those sins are actually part of your preparation. What you have gone through with, I think one of them is drug addiction. What you have gone through in your life serving these sins and being a slave to them is what he's going to base your ministry on sir be encouraged be encouraged rise up and do as he has called you to do he's going to help you overcome every one of those sins you're going to be delivered suddenly in the name of Jesus Christ 
And I declare your freedom right now in the name of Jesus. Set him free, Lord. Touch him and set him free. In Jesus' mighty name. The Lord wants Peter to demonstrate his fondness for him by loving and caring for people. Our love for God will always show itself in love and care for God's people. Peter was told to feed the Lord's lambs and to take care of his sheep. I like what Craig Goschel says when drawing out some lessons from the sins that Samson committed. He said, don't let what you did keep you from doing what God wants you to do. That's a word for somebody. There's a lady listening to this. That's a word for you, ma'am. You are not what you did. You used to be involved in prostitution. The Lord says, you are no more a prostitute, woman of God. Stand up. You are a woman of God. You are not what you did. You are who God made you to be. Jesus wanted Peter to know that he still had an assignment for him. Y'all, the anointing is so strong on me in this show. There are a lot of people here in this show now, and you're realizing that it's not over for you. It's not over for you. God wants to use you in these end times. He wants to use you powerfully, not a little bit, but for big things, y'all. All you have to do is submit. Turn away from the sins and he will do the rest. He will give you everything you need to do what he's called you to do. He always, where God guides, he always provides and he always empowers us to do what he commands us to do. We are able people because we serve an able God. The third thing that we get from how Jesus restored Peter is to follow faithfully. The key when we fail is not to wallow away or to run and hide. But to follow today. Don't run away. But follow today. We are to follow him no matter what has happened or what will happen. The command follow me in verse 19 is a present imperative. Which means keep on following me. We must follow faithfully today and keep on following him. No matter who else follows or who else don't. You may have a spouse that's not following. You may have a spouse that used to follow and has fallen away. You keep following. And Peter wanted to know (laughs) what Jesus was going to do about John. And I love the answer that Jesus gave in verse 22. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. If you have been praying to the Lord about somebody else's sin, he's asking you today, what is that to you? What is that to you? What we need to do, y'all, instead of praying about somebody else's sin, is we need to pray and confess the opposite of that. We need to confess that they're saved, they're serving the Lord. If we'll do that in our prayer time instead, we'll see results a whole lot faster. Pray the answer, not the problem. That's especially important for you new Christians. Pray the answer, not the problem. It's okay to tell the Lord a situation in your life you're concerned about, but then pray the answer. Lord, I thank you that, you know, I thank you my body's healed. I thank you there is health and no disease. I thank you there's abundance and no lack. You pray the answer and keep praying it and keep saying it throughout the day whenever you pray too. That will also help you to rejoice in the Lord. If you have trouble rejoicing in the Lord, just stop for a minute and think about what it means to be saved. You know, look around at the the world around you. You know, all the struggles that we go through in life and the fact that the world is literally just falling apart in front of us. There's so much sin and so much filth. It's going to be a good thing to get out of here and go to heaven, y'all. It's going to be a real good thing. There should be no more tears, no sorrow, no death, no destruction up there. We can rejoice that that's our home and we get to stay there forever. That should make you rejoice. Rejoice in your salvation. Okay, we need to remember... That however we have failed, failure is not permanent, okay? Failure is not final unless we let it be. Peter messed up by failing, and he failed big. He denied Christ, and he felt really bad, and he could have just given up, but he didn't. He moved to repentance and to restoration. Now, denying Christ in the end times when it comes to the mark of the beast, that is final. But In this time right now, you are not a failure just because you failed. Failure can be fruitful. If you study the life of Peter, you'll discover that his failure had a positive effect on his life. Before the failure, he was a little bit more reckless and brash and abrupt. But after repenting and being restored, he became more tenderhearted and more humbled. 
and he went on to become a great leader in the early church and wrote part of the New Testament. That's pretty awesome. And here's another good thing. You can strengthen others after you fail because now you know how easy it is to fail. A story was told about a little girl. Her mother and uh, father decided to sign her up for ice skating lessons. On the first day of class, the teacher spent the entire time teaching all the shaky skaters only two things. How to fall down and how to get up. The teacher knew that if you're going to skate on slippery ice, you're going to fall. And once you fall, you need to know how to get back up. So that's what she taught him. You know, I still remember when I first got saved, I still remember praying the prayer and saying, Lord, I can't promise you I'll never fall. But I do promise you that when I fall, I will get back up and I'll never give up on you if you won't ever give up on me. I still remember praying that prayer. And sometimes I kind of wonder if he was... You know, in heaven saying, you know what? She's really going to blow it a lot. So let's just give her a ministry where she can use that and be fruitful with it. I really think he might have done that. Here's the good news. God knew every time you and I would fail before he ever created us. Before he called us to do anything, he knew everything about us. He knew every day, every minute, every bad thing we were ever going to do, y'all. I have known people that started kind of ministries on YouTube. And, and YouTube, y'all, is a real good place to share. If you have a great passion for ministry and you've not been released into the world yet to do any ministry, get out on YouTube and make some videos and share the revelations that you have or, you know, anything God's spoken to you. You might help somebody or help a bunch of somebodies in the process uh, of just sharing what Jesus has done for you. It's a good place to start. But I've known a lot of people that started out on YouTube and they started so strong and they were so bold. And then the enemy attacked them. And for you new Christians, any time when you first get saved, the enemy always comes and attacks you. He attacks very strongly often too through the people closest to you because he can land a direct hit on you that will hurt you a lot more by attacking through them. So if that's happening to you, just ask God for strength and keep walking. Don't give up your faith. This is part of the faith walk. If you start a ministry somewhere, you start witnessing to people or you go out on YouTube and you make some videos, he's going to attack that too. And he's going to attack you through people out there. It's part of the process. Don't freak out. Just keep on walking and doing what you know is the right thing to do. These people that started out there, and, and there were several that I could name and won't name, they started so strong. They had lots of followers. They were touching lots of lives. The enemy attacked them. They made a mistake, they got into sin, and they folded. And in several of the cases I know, they took all their videos down. They went back to fishing. They just went back to fishing. And it's sad because Jesus could come back tonight. And I don't know what they're going to say to him when he says, Why didn't you continue what I had you doing? I don't know what he's going to say. If you have fallen, it's time to get back up. You may be down, but you're not out. Jesus died for all your sins. You can get up and move forward. He will forgive you. You repent, turn away from your sin. Don't do it anymore. And just move forward. He will help you. If you're leaking air, if your tires have holes in them, or if they're just losing air, it's time to plug those holes so you don't have a blowout and have your faith go flat. We need to keep up the spiritual disciplines in our lives. We need to pray. We need to worship. We need to spend time praising God. We need to be in the Word every day. Listen to sermons. Read the Word. Do everything that you can to strengthen your walk by learning about God. Y'all, Jesus is literally the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you want to be closer to Jesus, pick up your Bible. Pick up your Bible. He's right there. He's right there. You don't have to go anywhere to find him. He's right there. He will talk to you through it while you read it. For you new Christians, if you're reading the Bible, all of a sudden a, some, a sentence or a paragraph jumps off of the page. That's him speaking something to you about that sentence or that paragraph. And if you will be in the Word every day, even if that doesn't happen to you at first, it may or it may not, it will start happening to you. It happens to all Christians after a time. If you are truly seeking the Lord, he will be found by you. The Lord knows that we face temptations in life. 
He knows that we all have issues. He knows that. He knows all the skeletons in our closet. He knows the trials are going to come. But the greatest issue is not the devil coming after us to sift us. The greatest issue is can we hold on to our faith when he does. Do you all know what sifting was like in biblical times? It, it's like the definition is to like uh, to sift or separate or to pass through a sieve. But back then to thresh grain, it was trodden under animals. The animals ran over it and trampled it. And then they threw it into the air with a winnowing fork so the wind would blow on it and carry away the chaff. It was never an easy process by any imagination. How did Jesus handle when he was tempted? When he was tempted to fail, Jesus hit his knees. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in his greatest time of need, he did not try to stand on his own two feet. He fell to his knees and begged his father in prayer. And that's what we're supposed to do too. I'm going to tell you all a story. Tell you a story and then we're going to close this, okay? There was once a lady named Garbage Mary. She was dubbed that name by the media When she was picked up by police in a shopping mall in Delray Beach, Florida, she was a filthy mess. So was her car and her two-bedroom apartment. Neighbors told of her scrounging through garbage cans in search of food, which she took back to her apartment. Police found the garbage everywhere. It was in the refrigerator, the stove, the cabinets, even in the bathtub. But they found other things as well. They found mobile oil stock worth more than $400,000. They found documents indicating she owned oil fields in Kansas, stock certificates from prominent firms, and passbooks from eight large bank accounts. Police also discovered that Garbage Mary was the daughter of a well-to-do lawyer and bank director from Illinois who had died several years earlier. Garbage Mary was a millionaire, but she lived like a pauper. Great wealth was at her fingertips, But she spent her life sifting through garbage and trash. We live the same wasteful lives when we cling to our sin. Instead of living the abundant, joyful life Jesus died to give us. Can I just tell you that? Sin can never give you the joy Jesus wants you to have. It will drag you deeper and deeper into darkness. And if you wait too long, you will not be able to get free. Every time you sin, the devil's hold on you grows stronger. I am talking to somebody. I pray that this show has been a blessing to you. Thank you for listening. I want to tell you all one thing before I close this show. I've released a book on Amazon. Uh, It's available in Kindle. And if you go to Wings of Prophecy Facebook page, you'll find a link where you can get it in print. It's called No Longer Mine. And it is a collection of all the words to America and all the visions God has given me about America in one book in chronological order. One day I was thinking about, you know, the things that God has spoken here and there about America. And I thought, wow, you know, I wish I had all the words together where I could read them all so I could better understand what's coming. And I thought, why don't I just do that? And so I did. I put them all together in a little book and in a Kindle book called No Longer Mine. If you like the words to America that appear on the Wings of Prophecy site, those are all the words through the end of August, I believe, of this year. Anyway, I hope that's a blessing to you. Y'all have a great week. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for joining me today on Wings Radio. You can contact me by mail at Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 127, Princeton, Texas 75407, or by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com. Be sure to visit the blog page, wingsofprophecy.com. Wings of Prophecy is not affiliated with any denomination church or nonprofit organization. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where suddenly it just felt like your whole life was falling apart? I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. 
Wilderness experiences are time of great uncertainty and change. Uh, there are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many experiences, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led to the wilderness. Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. It's by Glenda Lomax and it's available on Amazon.com or WingsOfProphecy.com. Amazon.com, The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax. Are there areas of your life you just can't seem to overcome in, no matter what you try? Are you plagued by depression, poverty, anger, lust, or failure? Do you recognize your predisposition to commit the same sins committed by your forefathers? Do you want a better life? Many people live their whole lives under generational and other types of curses without understanding they can be free. Learn what the scriptures say about curses and why they are still relevant today. Learn how to defeat every one of them through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Hosea 4 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You can break the curses off your life and start experiencing breakthroughs like never before. Read about different types of curses and how to break them, including anger, a curse that causes angry outbursts in constant anger, barrenness, a curse that causes miscarriages and prevents pregnancies, fear, a curse that brings a plague of fear and anxiety, illegitimacy, a curse that causes lust, rebellion, and sexual dysfunction. Get the book, Loosed from Chains of Darkness, Destroying Curses Through the Power of the Cross, available now on Amazon.com, in print and Kindle. Loosed from Chains of Darkness, and be free. Have you ever been betrayed by someone you love deeply? If you have, then you know being betrayed by someone you love can be a life-altering experience. What you may not know is that every Christian must pass the test of absolute betrayal at least once in their Christian walk if they want to go higher. No test hurts more or pulls more strongly on your emotions than when someone you love completely turns against you. Do you know how to pass this test? Through a revelation received from the Lord, I share the good news about why betrayal visits Christians and how to pass this test once and for all. Don't let your betrayal catch you by surprise. Get the Judas test on Amazon.com in print and Kindle versions. The Judas test.